All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So Dr. Sayyid Heather does not need any introduction. He has become very popular helping acute COVID patients, helping post-COVID syndrome patients, and so on. So today he is with us again. My curiosity, the, the reason I requested was um, how is the long haul patients management? Uh, what are the new trends in there or what are his observations? And secondly, if anybody who may have vaccine and the symptoms afterwards of post vaccine side effects, what are the ways to manage them and what are the successes or not that he is seeing? So this is a general approach that I wanted to kind of get his update on. So uh, Dr. Heather, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. So on the side of this, uh, this window, we have the uh, comments as well. And if you can see, there yeah. are a number of uh, cool beans already here. Uh, there is a question from uh, a cool bean who was saying that he's desperate to get the answer. So I'm going to try to ask his question right away before okay. we continue with the rest of the discussion. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that you can sign up for free on my website. You don't have to pay anything to sign up and you can ask me questions for free. So, <laughs> you know, you can send me questions in the chat. It's not, uh, I don't charge for those. So thank you very much for that. That is actually a service as well for humanity. Rohit Sharma says, my 12 year old son got first Pfizer shot. Would delaying second shot to six, say six weeks lessen any chances of heart inflammation or would it make it worse? So I, I honestly don't know a lot about the vaccines. And I, you know, if you know the answer to this question, you can go ahead and tell him. I, yeah, so I Rohit, know. this is a question for which we do not yet have the data for what is the right answer. So th that means that if somebody is going to have a cross reactivity to their uh, cardiac tissue, that will be one week later or six weeks, I think their body is going to react that way. So the important thing is to talk with the doctor, make sure that they are aware that this can happen and are ready to make sure they can manage it. And also you are aware of the symptoms, the chest pain, persistent chest pain, which is an important symptom of the cardiac inflammation. So with this, once again, Dr. Heather, welcome. I'm going to quickly show uh, users um, number one. This is drbean.com. Here are some of the questions that we have on Twitter. Dr. Heather, if people wanted to reach out to you, what is the website to go to? So it's my name. It's drsyedhider.com. So D-R-S-Y-E-D-H-A-I-D-E-R.com. Got it. So D-R-S-Y-E-D-H-A-I-D-E-R.com. So this is the, the website. So if you are looking to connect with Dr. Sayed Heather, here is his link. I'm going to pick up this link and share it in the chat as well right now. Cool. So with this, let's ask our questions. So question, uh, the COVID, acute COVID, is the symptom set still the same? I'm especially thinking in terms of are you seeing with Delta or Lambdas or other variants, the symptoms have set changed or they are still the same? So symptoms are mostly the same, but I think we're seeing more of the, lately I'm seeing a lot of people with headaches and eye pain and cough. You know, that's uh, probably less of the runny nose and maybe less of the diarrhea even nowadays. But most of my patients, they don't know which variant they have. I, I don't think a single one of my patients has come and told me that they were actually tested and told that they had a specific variant. Right. Some of the some of the infections now seem to be more severe faster. That That is something I've noticed and just in the last month that people are progressing a lot faster early. Hmm. So faster towards severe, and I think that is because the, the virus is infecting the cells quicker, so it is able to cause destruction rapidly. Absolutely, yeah. And um, Although, you know, we're not seeing a whole, most of the practice right now is long COVID, actually. I think there's there twice as many long COVID patients right now than compared to the acute patients. But there are areas of the country where, you know, certain communities are having outbreaks still. This is a very interesting uh, uh, information that 
now you are seeing more long COVID, double the amount almost of long COVID than acute COVID. That's very yeah, at least in my practice. And you know, I've you know, I'm seeing some of the Incel DX patients, so they come from there, but mostly they're they're not coming from Incel DX. And the other thing that we're seeing more of now is that we're seeing people with the vaccine injuries are coming and people with other problems. Like I've seen a few mold toxicity patients who responded very, very well to ivermectin. I mean, it was shocking. I mean, I, I told the lady, you have mold toxicity. You don't have long COVID. <laughs> you don't have COVID. You need to leave your house. You know, <laughs> you're not going to get better unless you leave your house. She was almost normal after starting ivermectin. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, I've I don't treat mold toxicity, but I've read about it. And, you know, the people who do treat it, they tell you, you basically have to leave the mold. You know, there's no other solution. You know, you can, you know, detox all you want, but as long as you're in the house with the mold, there's, you're just not going to get better. But um, that, that was one of the most remarkable things. Mold toxicity, some Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, other post, you know, infectious syndromes that are similar to long haul COVID. So yeah, there's at least, double you know that group of patients compared to the acute covid patients right now that's very interesting uh, so dr heather is, uh, dr yo is with us as well He's here as well. <laughs> <laughs> welcome dr yo <laughs> maybe you can answer some questions for me <laughs> so dr yo this is now i'm going to be on the record dr yo does not like to join me on my show i have requested him a couple of times really <laughs> yeah so i am too little a show for him he's a big guy <laughs> So, so you you have to now come join me to to disprove my statement. Okay. So the the second question. Uh, I'm still I'm I'm going to go from acute to long to long COVID with the long COVID and vaccine. So for the acute one, is your management still similar to the old one, or your management is changed as well? So yeah, I think the management is constantly changing, constantly evolving. And so my management changes every time. You know, the last time I was on your show, people were asking me, what about, um, I think, Pepsid or something? You know, they, they were asking about the H2 blockers and the H1 blockers, and I wasn't really using them at the time. So I looked into it, and I, I list, I've actually listened to some of your shows since then. And um, I don't remember her name, but the the physician from England who was treating MCAS, she gave a you know Dr. talk Tina, on MCAS, yeah. right? So I listened to that, and that was very interesting. So I, I actually started recommending people use um, you know Claritin or Zyrtec and Pepsid, so an H1 and an H2 blocker, and acute and also long COVID. You know that they try that. Um, so I think that's beneficial. The other thing I started telling people is um, you know. Uh, some people have found, especially for long COVID, that um, you know fasting can help. Intermittent fasting and fasting for 48 hours once a week. Um, so that's one thing that I just put out there. You know, if you want to try this low histamine diet, I don't think I was really talking about that the last time, or you know, with patients. So I've you know started telling them that also, um, especially for long haulers. Um, for the other thing with acute COVID, I think I've become more aggressive with ivermectin, um, you know, especially after the FLCCC recommended higher dosing. So now I'll do it for, you know, if they're before day five, you know, basically similar to the FLCCC protocol, before day five, we'll start off with regular dosing. If they're not better in two days, then we double the dose and continue. Um, and then you know, like I had told you before that on before the show started on this email through with Dr. Yo, he he recommended actually treating for 14 days with ivermectin and then continuing if people aren't better in the acute phase. So I thought that was a great idea. So I personally what I do is um, continue them at least five days for daily ivermectin and then tell them if you're if you're feeling great, you know, then you can go to every three days um, and complete 14 days total of treatment plus the fluvoxamine. Um, and I've also I've also added pravastatin, you know, in consultation with Dr. Yo um, as well, because they're seeing that that seems to be very helpful for you know vascular inflammation. And um, the thought is that maybe that'll help us prevent long COVID and even more people. Um, and then I also usually use budesonide um, if they have any lung symptoms. And this was also I think one of Dr. Yo's suggestions that we add that. Um, so Got that it. I found very helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful for the lung inflammation. Got it. And I think that is why Dr. Yo does not 
come on my show because he knows <laughs> that there are folks who are <laughs> who are using using his message and they can come and talk about it. So then, why does he yeah, have to come yeah, in? yeah. So, I can plug Doctor Yo all day. <laughs> So here is Dr. Yo. He's actually giving me five dollars right now. So thank you. <laughs> so he's saying, "What is Dr. Heather's spirit animal? The incel DX team and our patients love Dr. Heather." <laughs> yeah, I remember I was watching uh, the show with Dr. Merrick, and I think he got this question also. <laughs> and I was thinking, what would I say? What would I say? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Maybe a dragon. I don't know. <laughs> One of my patients asked me, you know, she, she asked me, what kind of bean do you want to be? So I was, I don't know. What do you think? And she told me, um, you should be the fire bean. <laughs> um, I, I love the fire bean. So you are a fire bean from now on. <laughs> yeah. She actually, she, she gave me some, what was it? Borloda lingua, I don't know, something in uh, Italian, but the tongue of fire bean uh, specifically. Got it. So, so you are you are the tongue of fire bean and the dragon as well. Yeah. So that, that's a very interesting spectrum to cross from dragon. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> but hey. I'll take that. <laughs> so very good. So th this is the acute, and you're seeing less a number of patients. Are you seeing more youngsters now with acute, or you are still seeing a higher advanced age group? Yeah, I I don't really get a lot of kids. I mean, some of my patients come in, and the family has you know COVID nineteen, so you know, some of their kids will have it, you know, some of the teenagers will have it and I'll treat the teenagers. And I usually tell them, you know, I, I'm willing to treat people under 10, under 10, but they just do so well. You know, they, I haven't seen any problems in children under 10. I mean, it's just so extremely rare for a bad outcome at that age group. So I, I do treat some, um, occasionally I've treated children, you know, nine or 10, um, but they're just, they, they have such, such mild symptoms, generally speaking, and again, there's always going to be, you know, exceptions, but generally under 10, I haven't seen anyone who is really sick. You know, it's like one day of mild symptoms, then they're over it or they have no symptoms, right? They test positive with no symptoms. Um, over 10, you know, I have seen a handful of severe outcomes, you know, like I think last time I might've mentioned, I think it was a 16 year old girl, terrible long COVID symptoms. Um, so she came to me with long COVID. She didn't come with the acute infection. I still haven't seen very sick children under 20 in my own practice. I mean, I, I see them, you know, they're sick, but they're very, very mild infections under 20. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. So there's a question from Nyko saying, Dr. Heather, what's your consider, what do you consider normal ivermectin dosing in acute cases? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I think I'm doing what Incel DX recommends generally, which is the 0.2 milligram per kilogram before day five. That's what I'll start with for two days. And if they're not getting better, then I'll double it to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram, um, you know, once a day with food. And then if they come to me on day five or later, then I just tell them to go straight to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. Um, I think there was one hospitalized patient, you know, it's hard to do anything in the hospital, but, um, you know, I recommended that they do 0.6 uh, in the hospital for pretty severe infection. I don't think I've gone up to 0.6 in the outpatient setting yet. You know, but I might if somebody just wasn't getting better. Yeah, I have never gone to 0.6. I have so far a 0.2 to 0.4. And 0.4 in long COVID, especially with anosmia, it works like magic. Two or three days and done. Anosmia goes away. So uh, let's switch to the long COVID. So two categories. One are the patients after COVID who have become long haulers. And the other one are the patients after the vaccine who have become sort of a long hauler as well. And my own family members are part of that group as well. So I know it that this is happening. So question about the long COVID. What is the, the age group that you're seeing? What are the people which who are more affected? Is there a specific people that, hey, they should have some comorbidities or anyone can become in a long hauler? Yeah, I think it's anyone, unfortunately. I don't think we really know how to predict who's going to develop long-haul COVID yet. Um, so, you know, I think I meant, probably mentioned it last time. It's mostly 20 to 55-year-olds, um, generally speaking. I don't see a lot of people over that. I mean, there are some who are older. And again, there's a couple who are younger. But the vast majority are 20 to 55. And generally speaking, it seems like they're pretty healthy, actually, before they got COVID. And, you know, a lot of times it's people who 
where, you know, the long COVID is triggered by exercise. So it's a lot of people who exercise to begin with and they're healthy and they eat really well. And then, you know, they'll start exercising again too soon. And then that triggers long COVID or they just happen to have the birthday cake and, you know, some junk food and, uh, and that might trigger it um, or stress or something. Um, so this, you know, unfortunately I, we haven't done a great job I think anywhere, but especially here in the U.S., talking, you know, educating people about how to prevent long COVID, you know. Um, so I think everyone should be told, like the whole country should be told, don't really exercise for 30 days, you know. Don't eat junk food, you know. Don't drink alcohol, you know. Just be very careful for the first at least 30 days, sometimes even six weeks might be safer, you know. And this is within getting COVID? Uh, so 30 days of? After the start of symptoms, yeah. So th that is your, that's a very profound message that if you get COVID-like symptoms, hold on to doing rigorous things and eating junk foods for 30 days. I mean, especially, at least, you know, I think what often triggers it is the heart rate elevation. You know, if you go over 100 or, you know, if you go and do cardiovascular exercise. So some, some of the patients are okay with exercise that doesn't raise their heart rate. But once your heart rate elevates, that seems to be that trigger. Got it. At least that's what I've seen. That's very interesting. Uh, Dr. Sumit Kesare, he is from India. He's a physician. If the patient presents with pneumonia on day four, which is very much seen nowadays, would you recommend steroids this early? So, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, you're, you're still in the, the viral phase. You're not into the inflammatory phase, but... Um, so you, you want to give the immune system, this is personally speaking, um, I would want to give the immune system the best chance in the first week or so. And, you know, you, you always have to decide, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen anyone so far with bacterial pneumonia with COVID in the outpatient setting. I'm sure it's very common in hospitals, but I haven't seen it or diagnosed it yet. Um, and I think the same thing when our patients go to urgent care, they hesitate to give them anything because they tell them that you have COVID pneumonia or pneumonitis. It's not a bacterial infection, you know, the the character of the disease ha doesn't change at all. You know, they, they get diagnosed with pneumonia, but it's just a continuation of their COVID, you know, disease process. Um, and so there's really no reason to treat it any differently than you treat COVID. You know, you treat it, it, it it's just one of the manifestations of COVID-19. If they're hypoxic, you know, you would usually go to ciproheptadine first. Um, and that often works really well, actually. Hmm. Ciproheptadine so you works. using ciproheptadine for hypoxia? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I started using it after, you know, talking to um, a few Fried people Jalali. who used it. Yeah, Fareed Jalali and uh, Dr. Corey and got their input. You know, they, they've used it in the ICU. And, you know, I asked them, is this safe in the outpatient setting? And they said, sure, if you're careful, you know, and, you know, assess the patient and make sure that they're not too drowsy to begin with, because it can make people more drowsy. So yeah, I've seen remarkable, you know, turnarounds with ciproheptadine. You know, it's not, I don't use it a whole lot because most of my patients don't get that sick outpatient, but some of them do. And some of them just refuse to go to the hospital because they know they're not going to get what they need. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, ciproheptadine works wonders. Um, yeah. So I think on day four, unless you're convinced the patient has, you know, bacterial pneumonia, in which case go for the, um, antibiotics obviously uh but other people who are treating this in the icu they they may um uh they may have something different to say because i, I honestly don't see a lot of covid pneumonia in the first week it's usually got the it. second week that it gets diagnosed got it. got it so before we continue our discussion for the long COVID, genesis light says how does inter intermittent fasting help long COVID? what method is so that? yeah i mean my understanding is that it's the autophagy you know so we're helping the body, you know, actually ivermectin also triggers autophagy. I just learned this and, and a lot of different things do. So fasting is one of the things that triggers autophagy and it helps the body basically get rid of junk that it needs to get rid of like the S1, you know, subunit of the spike protein that's, you know, causing long COVID in a lot of people. And the, the, the intermittent fasting is what? Is it that they're eating or not eating and they're drinking water or not drinking? What is the... Uh, yeah, so if, so intermittent fasting means that you're going to eat in, for example, an eight-hour window every day. So you're going to fast the rest of the time. So a 16-hour fast where you can drink water, but you don't eat any calories. Um, and then you eat maybe one or two meals within eight hours. So that, that's how most people do it. 
Um, and then, you know, to trigger even more autophagy, a lot of people are doing two days, like just a water fast, uh, you know, Saturday and Sunday, for example, for 48 hours, and then going back to the intermittent fasting the rest of the week. And then at the same time, just, you know, you have to eat clean. You, you can't eat a lot of junk carbs and, you know, junk food. Got it. Got it. This is fascinating, actually. Uh, Arun Mehta says, a patient with severe COVID, 80% lung damage. There's a lot of damage. Initially, he was not given avamectin. In semi-ICU, he was given avamectin and IVIG. He's saved, but breathlessness is here. So yeah, I mean, 80% lung damage is quite severe. And I don't see a lot of patients with such severe disease, even the long haulers. Usually, they, most of the long haulers that come to me you know, they have clean CT scans. Every study they've done came back normal and they still had symptoms, right? So, you know, I think Dr. DeMello in India, he was telling me, he sees a lot of people who have severe, you know, appearance on their CT scan. And and obviously, you know, it does happen, but um, yeah, they just haven't shown up in my practice as much. Got it. Dr. Yo says, question for Dr. Heather, his thoughts on metazapine versus fluvoxamine. Yeah, I don't think I have any intelligent thoughts on this. Um, I have not really used mirtazapine much. And in the beginning, I was using it, you know, offering it to people if they had trouble sleeping with fluvoxamine, you know, as uh, to try to help them sleep. And it didn't really seem to work that great for most patients. Um, but some patients, uh, I think a, a very small percentage, I've given them mirtazapine and that d d helped a lot with long COVID. Um, obviously, it has a different mechanism than fluvoxamine does. Got it. Uh, Andrew White, one could argue whether work or exercise should be undertaken 24 hours before and possibly sev several days after any vaccine. So I guess from your question about the COVID, long COVID that, hey, avoid rigorous exercises, should that be the similar message after vaccine too? Uh, you know, possibly. I think long COVID is so prevalent with um, COVID-19, but vaccine injuries are not that common. You know, so like people get really worried about it, but in the overall, you know, I mean, if you look at the, the data for vaccine injuries, and I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg, but even then, it's just, it doesn't seem to be that common. With COVID-19, you know, you're worried that like half your patients are going to get long COVID. There's nothing like that with vaccines. It's not even close, right? I mean, there, there's a tiny percentage of people who end up with vaccine side effects, as far as I know. So I, I think with vaccines, you know, this is why I think, you know, most of what Dr. Merrick said, I agreed with, I think like 99% of what he said, I was shocked. Um, but like, I think he mentioned also that, you know, you, you, you kind of discussed briefly with him, should we pre-treat, post-treat people, everyone who gets a vaccine? And, you know, you hesitate to say that because hardly anyone's going to get a vaccine injury. So how, how can you recommend treating everyone, you know, to prevent a vaccine injury when it's going to be so rare to begin with? So, so the same probably goes for the exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not going to harm you not to exercise for a few days. So, you know, some people, if they're really worried and they come to me, I'll, I'll tell them, yeah, take the ivermectin, you know, keep the fluvoxamine on hand if you get a vaccine, you know, just in case, you know, treat at the first sign of symptoms. And some people want to treat before they get the vaccine. You know, they're just, they want to be overly cautious. And if you're using ivermectin, I don't think it's going to be um, a problem. You know, it's not harmful. Although... Today, one of my patients just came to me and asked me, you know, they told me that the FLCCC has two conflicting statements on their website. And I didn't have a chance to check this yet, but they said that one of the statements said that you should avoid ivermectin before or soon, you know, in in close proximity to the vaccine. Um, so, Dr. Muveen, what do you think about that? I, I remember that you had said you, you had a whole, you know, the last time I spoke to you, you were saying that it would probably help prevent the vaccine side effects, but wouldn't interfere with the vaccine efficacy. Yeah, so it, from a mechanism point of view, it is still the same. Uh, vaccine's mechanism, sorry, ivermectin's mechanism does not interfere with the vaccine except keeping the inflammation low. For example, it binds with ACE2, sorry, uh, binds with ACE2 and the spike protein. So vaccine makes a spike protein inside the cell, so it doesn't really have anything. Ivermectin doesn't have much to do there. Then uh, ivermectin disrupts RDRP which vaccine does not make an, an RDRP. Ivermectin disrupts three chymotrypsin like protease or MPRO protein of the virus, which vaccine does not make it. Similarly, virus uses its protein to send the cargo to the nucleus using important alpha and beta. Vaccine doesn't do that. 
So the only common pathway for virus and the vaccine is uh, inflammation using nuclear factor kappa B. And, and uh, ivermectin in a mild way uh, modulates that. So because of it, ivermectin can actually help prevent a lot of side effects, but also not suppress the immune system to not respond to vaccine. So that's the right. beauty of this drug. Uh, so I have a question here. Lori says, and I'm going to put it up. It's going to probably cover the whole screen. The basic idea of the question is that I was using long haul protocol. Then I have reverted back what is going on. And so my question would be with in the context of this question, do you see long haul patients recovering, then relapsing? What happened? So I'm going to put the question up for a second. So Lori Larson says, I'm an, I am on the FLCCC long COVID protocol. I started about four weeks ago with ivermectin and fluvoxamine. I did not do well with the fluvoxamine and they ended up giving me a steroid. The last 2.5 weeks I've been on ivermectin, vitamin C, D3, atorvastatin, and melatonin. The first week my chest pressure cleared up and the following week I was feeling like I was turning the corner. This week I've gone backwards and have chest heaviness different from the chest pressure I had and energy level is worst. Yeah, so, I do see this sometimes. Um, and I, you know, some long haulers do have, you know, ups and downs with their symptoms, but, you know, it seems like she felt that the, the treatment actually made her significantly better and then she got worse again. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I, I don't, I'm not sure what's so, happening with so these So I people. have seen some patients relapsing. And what, what I've seen is that then using other parts of the long haul protocol, for example, let's say if you're following in cell, maybe adding Miravirak or uh, adding antihistamines or the MCAS activation syndrome prevention. So there are other parts of the protocol that needs to be added to then see what is the outcome. So, uh, so tell me this, generally, if you wanted to package up the management for long COVID, how do you start? What do you see? What is your overall approach to the management? We, we've been talking about bits and pieces. If you put them together, what is the management? So, uh, you know, there's different approaches. I mean, mostly I follow the FLCCC approach nowadays where I start off with ivermectin because, you know, it's the, you know, it's very safe and a lot of people respond to it. That's what I've seen. And, and a lot of people also want to start just with ivermectin because they look at the side effects for fluvoxamine and mirtazapine or, you know, fluvox, sorry, fluvoxamine and Ravrock, and they're scared away, you know, um, and, you know, you can reassure them and everything, but most people feel comfortable with ivermectin and I do too, you know, so why not start off just using that and see and give them a chance to get better just with that and maybe some dietary changes and, you know, low histamine and, you know, maybe some H2, H1 blocker um, and see what happens. And then if if that doesn't work, and, and I'll do the, you know, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram for a week usually and then double it the next week if it's not working. Um, and then, you know, see what happens. And if they're not getting better, usually the next one, if I don't have in-cell DX test results, will be fluvoxamine. Um, give that a try. And and you really have to have a conversation with the patient because some people, you know, they just don't want to use a psychiatric drug, you know, for whatever reason, and um, they're turned off by it. So, so it'll either be fluvoxamine or the steroid because the steroid is also very safe, you know, a low-dose steroid especially like your protocol. Um, so I'll, I'll frequently go from ivermectin to the low dose steroid and give them a chance on that. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously if they're having, you know, neurological symptoms, then fluvoxamine might come a little bit earlier. I like to give them at least a week to see how a medication affects them so that they can see the benefits and the side effects of it. And then, um, and then add if they if they have some benefit but it's not 100% then continue the first medication that they're on for example ivermectin and then add the steroid and see if they have further benefit um, and then you know give them at least a week of the steroid before starting maybe fluvoxamine so personally i like to you know kind of have this rolling basis where you you start one medication give it at least a week to have some effects and then you know if you start three or four different medications at the same time sometimes you're not sure what's causing what you know, do you really need all of them? And um, what what's causing the side effect? If there is a side effect, you don't know what to drop. Got it. Sorry, please. 
although the, you know there's there's not a whole lot of overlap in the side effects. The, I think the only side effect I've seen common between ivermectin and fluvoxamine is kind of this restless leg twitching kind of side effect that some people get. Um, so that's more common with fluvoxamine, and it, but it has happened just with ivermectin also. So there there is that one side effect that would be an overlap. Um, you know, I guess dizziness and nausea could happen with both also. So there, there are some side effects that overlap. So if patients get one of those, you wouldn't be sure which one it was if you started them both together. Got it. And I see Arubaga had a question. Arubaga, I missed your question. So can you please uh, write it again? Uh, so if we now switch from the long COVID, or well, let me ask you one last question, which is my curiosity. So your own long COVID patient, what is your impression? So, of course, you're not doing a study to say, here is all the, the numbers of the people, and then here are the ones that... What is your impression of recovery rate? So, I think somewhere maybe 5% get better just within days. You know, they, they're the very fast responders to ivermectin. And then, you know, 80% get better eventually within, you know, a few weeks or a couple of months, they're back to normal. And then there's these hard cases, you know, five to ten percent, maybe fifteen percent, that you're you're not sure what to do. You try different drugs, you know, you know that that's just the beginning, you know, with uh, ivermectin, fluvoxamine. In the maybe you go to Mravrock, maybe you go to colchicine. You start adding other things, trying other other approaches, um, and and some people you really have a hard time, you know, getting them there. And most of those people I tell go to Incel DX, you know, go and get some blood testing done, so that, you know, and the, the benefit of incel DX, there's there's a couple of great things about it. So some people will have a clear, you know, the symptoms will clear up really fast, but then you repeat the incel DX test and it's not quite there yet. There's still a lot of inflammation and that tells you, you know, we're not done yet. Even though you're feeling great, let's keep going, you know, and let's repeat the test again. And, you know, obviously you have to have the means, but if you do have the means, then it's very helpful to see that because it'll help you know, okay, now we're done. You know, even though you've been feeling great this whole time, there was still a lot of inflammation. We see it, you know, it went down, it went down, it went down. Finally, it's gone. Now we can back off and taper off the drugs and hopefully you won't have any relapse. And the, the other group of patients are the ones who don't get better, actually, but you see their test is improving, right? And you know you're on, at least you know you're on the right track. You can give them some, you know, um, it's like proof, like here, we have this to show you that we are, you, the underlying inflammation is getting better. So if you're just patient, you know, a little bit longer, your symptoms will catch up with it. So, um, that's, that's profound, profound, actually, that you can actually look into their labs to see that they are moving in the right direction, even if the symptoms are not yet subsided. Yeah. Louis Grande says, have two times vax in Feb back to RN clinicals in the fall. I am mildly concerned with COVID. Would you support ivermectin prophylaxis? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I give it to people who've been vaccinated if they request it. Um, is it really necessary? I don't know. I mean, we, we don't really know a lot of things about vaccinations and COVID. You know, there's a lot of unknowns, right? The Delta variant and new variants, you know, are you fully protected or not, you know? You know, I think the jury's still out. You know, the vaccines have only been around for a short period of time. So certainly people are still concerned that there's new variants coming out and we're not done with the variants. You know, there's going to be more variants. And will the vaccine protect them against those new variants? We don't really know. I mean, we expect it will. Um, but there's some data to suggest that it, it doesn't work as well against the new variants. Um, even, you know, two, two vaccines Generally speaking, you know, we're told that they're very effective, regardless of the variant. But we're not done with variants yet, right? There's there's going to be another variant around the corner. Yeah. So yeah, I, I do I do um, I do prescribe it. Got it. Thank you very much, Arun. If you have a question, can you please type that again? So, uh, Doctor Heather, if we can switch to the post-vaccine injury, and there are some patients that are even within my own family as well, uh, and for for the curiosity of the audience, my wife has fully recovered now. And thank God, touch word, it's actually, it was scaring me very much. Dr. Heather, what happened was she had J&J &J, and about three weeks later, she developed um, so many symptoms. She would sleep all the time. She'll become tired all the time. And she's a 
very active woman. So for her to be sleeping or being tired or even the feeling of that mm. was very difficult. And uh, now she it's about, I think she's in fourth month now and she has fully recovered from all of those. But it took a lot of time for her to recover. So the question, post-vaccine injury, how many such patients are you seeing? What are their symptoms like? Are they very similar to post-COVID or they're different? Yeah, they, you know, I've seen a handful, maybe five or 10 so far, you know, more are coming, um, but uh, so far maybe 10. Um, and they don't seem exactly like long haulers. You know, they seem to have more targeted specific symptoms. Um, for the first one I saw, just terrible tinnitus was the main symptom. Um, and uh, so, so it seems to hit one one area, um, and they don't have the whole constellation of long haul symptoms that you usually see, but they'll have like one of them or two of them, you know, specific ones. Um, and uh, so far, ivermectin seems to work really well for for them, and they seem to respond very quickly to it. Um, it doesn't always solve the entire problem, but it gets them significant relief, you know, maybe 70, 80% relief just from ivermectin. That's been my experience. Um, one patient, you know, had significant relief, but then migraines came back. He, he used to get migraines in the past and uh, ivermectin somehow triggered his migraines to come back. So, so it's not all, you know, roses. Um, there are sometimes side effects, unfortunately. Um, and I think another patient also said the same. The, actually, this other patient had, um, it was either long haul or post-vaccine injury. I think it was post-vaccine. But she told me that her migraines actually went away. <laughs> you know, everything else got worse, but her migraines were gone. So I, you know, I don't know what the link is with migraines, but, you know, I was worried with her that, you know, maybe we're going to fix everything, but your migraines are going to come back. You know, which one do you want? Do you want the long, you know, COVID or, you know, post-vaccine injury, or do you want the migraines? Mm. Um, you know, some migraines are related to serotonin. So maybe there's something with serotonin metabolism going on in long haulers. Got it. So, so for the post-vaccine injury, um, I have also observed a lots of folks with tinnitus, and the visual disturbance, vision disturbance. Uh, still, the uh, approach is ivermectin, or do you use steroids or fluvoxamine or, or yeah, gen yeah, generally it's ivermectin, and then if they have neurological side effect, you know, something that's really attributable attributable to the brain, um, I'll, I'll offer them fluvoxamine. Still, I, I still like to try at least the ivermectin for a week before adding the fluvoxamine, just so I can separate the effects, um, and. Uh, and you know, if we don't get anywhere with the first few weeks or a month, I usually refer them to Incel DX to get further testing. But it's all the same drugs. You know, it's the ivermectin, it's the steroid, the fluvoxamine, Ravrock. I mean, it's the same medications used for long haul that we're using for vaccine injuries. Got it. Uh, Rose says, do you offer the ivermectin to non-vaccinated patients? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's the main group is the non-vaccinated patients are the ones who are getting uh, ivermectin prophylaxis, definitely. Right. B Curious says, are you following your numbers with acute patient care? How does your care compare to the national average for various patient populations? Yeah, I, I wish I had the staff to do this. You know, I'm, I'm saving now, you know, all the people that come to me with acute COVID. Um, before, I wasn't even able to save, you know, all the people, but I, I set up my EMR so that I can save the ones who have come to me and at some point, hopefully go through all of them. You know, it requires a lot of, um, you need staff time to do this because you have to, a lot of people are lost to follow up. You know, they, they come to you and get treatment and then they never follow up. They never come back. You know, you tell them, you know, follow up. But then you need somebody to go in, and unfortunately, I, it's not possible for me to automate it. So I would have to hire somebody to go and call them and email them and be like, "How are you doing? You know, what happened?" So I, I wish I had, you know, this um, staff. Right now, our staff—I mean, they're working like 70, 80 hours a week—and it's hard to hire people fast enough, actually, to keep up. So there's just a staff problem, staffing problem. And I, and I see this in my practice as well that. Uh, in the beginning, patients are desperate because they're scared, they're nervous, and uh, yeah. they're not. And so their contact is a lot. And then as they start improving, for me, the the way to understand that they're improving is that their contact would start reducing and then finally yeah. disappear. 
And yeah. <laughs> when they just stop, I know that, okay, they've become... Uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, it's partly an assumption, but yes, that this is what I've seen. Um, you know, patients can follow up with me really easily. They can, you know, basically indefinitely, they can send me messages as, as many times as they want. So um, I'll see exactly the same thing. The first few days, there's a lot of, you know, back and forth, you know, what do I do now? This is now this is happening and that's happening. And these are my vitals now. And, you know, now I'm having the side effect, you know, what should I do next? So, so I'll, I'll, most people, you'll get that back and forth for a couple of days. And then they, you know, most of them, kind of drop off and and you don't hear from them again and very rarely will i have people who actually get worse if we start in the first six days i i, I just don't see that you know in the first five or six days if you start treatment it's very very rare that you're going to end up worse you know the people who come and you have trouble managing them are the ones who come you know after day seven eight nine ten you know they're coming too late you know and then all bets are off you know it's uh you can do high dose ivermectin you can do you can throw everything at it and it still might turn into long covid you know it's just uh, it's difficult to treat after day six so you want to get it before that day eight you know i i also i don't remember his name either but the doctor from south africa that was also a very very interesting Chetty? Dr. talk Chetty? yeah dr chetty yeah that was a fantastic talk yeah. yeah the day eight treatment yeah. so and um just for the reference as well from my side too i have seen that uh, somebody asked this question here in the comments to early aggressive treatment in the long covid my out of all the patients, not thousands, but hundreds, uh, because I primarily do not uh, look at the patients, I do medical teaching. But out of all the hundreds of patients now, uh, three became long haulers. And I attribute that to early aggressive treatment that they just, I just attack the system right in the beginning. I don't take a chance. And I don't even stop the medicines until the patient says, all right, I'm all good, hands up, stop. And so yeah. that is when I, so yeah. Jim says, questions, are you giving large doses of vitamin D3 and K2 and K7? So I'm not sure what the, um, uh, how K2 would help. I, I don't know how that would help, but I do recommend people, you know, use higher doses of D3. So sometimes I'll tell people to take, you know, 50 or even a hundred thousand right at the start of the infection, you know, day one. Um, or they can take 15,000 a day, you know, for a week. So, yeah, I do tell people to take high dose D3 in, in the very beginning. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Mubin, is, do you know how K2 might help? I do tell them, you know, in general, K2 is important, but I don't know how it works for COVID specifically. Yeah, so, so basically, K2 is a partner to D3. So when right. D3 is given and it causes increased calcium absorption and mobilization and reabsorption from the kidney, now that calcium can start depositing in the wrong places, right. K2 acts as a partner with that to say, okay, calcium, you're not going to get into the blood vessel wall. Go right, right. With this. So it yeah, is into the bones. Partner. Yeah. So I, I mean, I do mention to everyone that you need to have K2 for that reason, but I don't know if it specifically would help with you know the acute COVID pathology. But yeah, no, um, just I, the, it's yeah. supporting D3. Right. Yeah. No, I do tell them that they should take K2 with it. Got it. Um, Ramu Bhar says, do long haul vaccine persons need to stay away from exercising, eating junk, good or alcohol to recover? I think they really do. You know, I people who are like addicted to jogging or exercise, I see them just not getting better, you know, and, and you have to keep telling them, stop jogging, stop exercising. I know. I mean, my dad was like a marathoner. He ran like 30 marathons or something. So I know what it's like to be addicted to jogging. I mean, my dad loved jogging. I mean, that was like his life. And so, you know, it gives you a runner's high, you know, it makes you feel great. And I've had the experience too, you know, after a few months, if you exercise persistently, you feel fantastic and you, you want to do it every day because it just makes you feel good. And so it's really hard for people to give it up. You know, they, and it, and it makes them feel bad. They can see that they feel bad. They don't feel good anymore when they exercise, but it's so deeply ingrained that they keep expecting to feel better. And it's such a, you know, integral part of who they are in their life that it's very hard to give up. And, but eventually, you know, if you keep telling them and, and they can see it themselves that the results aren't there, they're just feeling bad every time they do it. I don't think I've seen a single, maybe like one long hauler who told me they could exercise and that didn't make them, make them feel worse, you know, out of hundreds of long haulers. Um, and, and that was probably not cardio. It was probably more weightlifting that he was doing, you know, so he was, he wasn't getting his heart rate up maybe two so far who, who've told me that they can do the low, like, you know, non-cardio exercise that they're able to handle. But most people, even that 
is is too much for them. Even if they're not getting the heart rate up, any any kind of physical exertion is usually too much for long haulers. So right. that's my experience. I, I don't think it's recommended. Definitely not recommended. Junk food, absolutely not. Alcohol, no. You know, you just don't want, want to put anything stressful or inflammatory in your system. Got it. Arubaga says, how many straight days of ivermectin can one do continuously? I, I don't think there's an upper limit that we know of yet. Um, I've had people do it for, a lot of people do it for at least a month, you know, every day. And some people have even gone beyond that. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I heard of, you know, a study where somebody took it for a year. I don't, I could never track that down. But I, I don't think there's a limit. You know, some eventually people do um, often start seeing some side effects of it, especially if they continue longer, and then they they decide to stop or cut back. So I, I don't think it's really necessary to do it. You know, I, I was giving a lot of people like a month. You know, just keep doing it because you might get better. You know, we've heard of you know one or two people here or there they got better because after they did it for 21 days or 30 days, it's very rare if you don't respond in the first week or two. It's extremely rare that you're going to respond after doing it for 21 or 30 days that just i, I don't see that really so you know I generally agree. yeah I, I don't recommend continuing on and on and on hoping that ivermectin is going to work just move on try something else um, you might keep ivermectin every three days or something but um it's not something you need to keep going with you know just try something else <laughs> so what is your uh, second line or does it depend upon the symptoms uh, it does somewhat. So, yeah, I've I've actually started using the steroids second line because you know, especially at the lower dose, a steroid is very safe, and why not? You know, just give it a try. It's a broad spectrum anti-inflammatory. We know that the problem is inflammation, um, and it's I think it's the second line now in the FLCCC protocol. So a lot of people kind of expect it and want to do that first. Um, so yeah, I. If there's the neurological symptoms or, or really like, you know, brain fog or something, um, often the fluvoxamine will be a close second to the steroid. Got it. Art Patron Forever says, for bean, a question for bean, exactly like Diet Coke or light beer, not as filling, but all the pleasure of the real thing. Questions for <laughs> bean, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So we'll continue. Uh, Luis Grande says, high dose of D3, when do you taper patients down to reduce inflammatory response, M1 to M2? Um, high dose of D3, I don't know. What, what are we talking about here, M1 to M2? So we're talking about in the long haul protocol on the FLCCC, there is a concept of uh, turning M1 macrophages into M2 mm. or the pro-inflammatory right. to repair. So what dose of D3 is necessary or... So there was, so I think this is something that I need to clarify. There is a study that shows that presence of vitamin D causes conversion of M2 to M1, which is bad. On the other hand, there is also a study that shows presence of vitamin D convert from M1 to M2. So I had a discussion with Dr. Paul Marek offline, and he said that he doesn't think it actually has any such effect. So vitamin D levels should be kept normal. If they are below, then a higher dose of vitamin D is necessary. And this M1, M2 concept is not. Important. So yeah, for what, what I do with my approach to vitamin D is that they should be in the normal range. And then I usually check parathyroid hormone. And if it's, um, you know, above 30, I want to get it below 30, um, suppress the parathyroid below 30. So if they're in the normal range and their parathyroid is below 30, then I think that their vitamin D is probably optimal. Um, and so some people need to be higher in the normal range than others. Um, and some people don't need to be that high. So, so, you know, I see people coming to me who finally check their vitamin D, you know, they've been taking really high doses for, you know, a year and they'll come and they'll have, you know, ex you know, 120 or 130 and they're just out of the range. Um, so that I don't think it's helpful to be super high and you don't need to be higher than what you personally need. And, and so the normal range is pretty wide, right? Um, so, yeah, 39, so, yes. right. So, you know, where should you fall in that normal range? You know, and the only way that I can think of it is to use parathyroid to help you, you know, establish that. Got it. Bilal from New Jersey says, I'm one, though, one of those who are injured from J&J &J vaccine for three months now. Is it too late to treat people after three months of inflammation? 
Yeah, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, you know, anti-inflammatories treat inflammation. You know, if it's there, they'll treat it. So I would, I would definitely try to treat it. And, you know, most people will notice that, you know, mo almost everyone who comes to me after, you know, a year or, you know, longer um, uh, with long COVID, you know, people are coming after a year of it. Or, or even more than a year, you know, like nearly a year and a half, some people um, suspect at least that they had it. You know, people from last February, March um, 2020 are coming with long haul COVID and they're, they're as easily treatable as anyone else. You know, there's no difference. Um, so uh, the, the other thing that they notice, what I was gonna say is that most people see that their symptoms are gradually declining over time. So we do expect that people will eventually just get better on their own. It's just can take a really long time and we're trying to speed it up. Um, so I would be interested in asking him, you know, if he's noticed any improvement at all. Um, and then, you know, some people, you know, I do get long haulers who get worse after the vaccine. So, so their symptoms were nearly gone or gone completely. And then the vaccine worsened them, but still, you know, that's just a, it's a temporary thing. It, it'll go away also, I expect. Got it. John B says, anybody getting eye tearing or tearing or irritating with ivermectin? So I haven't seen anyone with uh, like red tearing eyes, uh, or really irritated eyes, but you know, higher doses frequently cause hard to describe visual effects. So patients will tell me that things appear kind of amber or kind of like weird colored or, or they just can't even explain. Their eyes just feel different. So that's a very common effect at higher doses that's frequently reported in studies and I see it. Um, in my patients a lot, and it goes away if you stop it. It's a short-term side effect. Got it. So Dr. Samina Chaudhary, she is a physician in Bangladesh. Whether you use anticoagulants routinely? So I, uh, I, I use aspirin, you know, certainly with everyone who comes in as long as they can take it. Um, beyond that, I, I'm not currently using a lot, you know, anything stronger than that. Um, I would consider it if somebody had, you know, significant lung inflammation with a long haul COVID that came in and, you know, this was after talking to Dr. DeMello. And um, so I've, I've actually used it for long haulers. In the past, I used it for acute infection um, when there was significant pneumonitis on a CT scan. I, I would give them Lovenox sometimes. That was uh, after consulting with Dr. DeMello, this was my approach initially um, was to give them, you know, Lovenox if they could take it. And if they could learn how to do it um, at home, injections, uh, if they had hypoxia and significant, you know, pneumonitis on the CT scan, COVID pneumonitis. Nowadays, I'm, I usually generally just go straight to ciproheptadine and that seems to reverse it pretty quickly. Got it. And uh, Dr. Heather, I wanted to appreciate you. So you talked about Fareed Jalali and ciproheptadine. You talked about Tina Pierce and antihistamines. You talked about Dr. Paul Marek, Dr. Corey, Dr. Chetty, Dr. DeMello. You talked about me as well. You talked about Incel DX as well. All of this research and listening to all of these and, and curating information from there, the eventual beneficiaries are your patients. So they are lucky that their doctor is, is looking around and finding solutions. So thank yeah. you very much for doing I, this. I'm lucky that all these people are teaching me what to do. <laughs> That's, I'm the lucky one. And yes, and I think patients are also lucky that we're able to, you know, collaborate so easily nowadays, you know, through email and, you know, listening to YouTube lectures. And uh, it's just incredible that we can collaborate with people all over the world so so easily and share information. Agreed. Um, Agreed. William Goff, he's a healthcare professional. I've seen papers from CDC based on 500,000 deaths from covid and the comorbidities associated and was shocked that hyperlipidemia was second to hypertension and way above diabetes and obesity. Have you seen your patients with hyperlipidemias to be more severely affected? Um, I haven't noticed that. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't really noticed that yet. Got it. Um, so Dr. I mean, a lot of patients do have... Um, a lot of patients do have, uh, you know, statins who come to me. So they certainly have hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia. Got it. So Dr. Yo says that he's already thumbs down our, our video. So we have to stop collaborating with Dr. Yo. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, so he is now on the shit list. <laughs> okay, so um, Jody says, we are going to Brooklyn, unvaxxed, for a weekend. First trip, 
all year. Ivermectin first and third day or just once. Thank you. Also, do you do telemedicine for healthcare than COVID? You're a great doctor. I do a little bit. Nowadays, there's just such a focus on COVID that it's kind of hard for me to shift gears. But I do do a little bit of, of you know, some other things for patients, certainly, especially if they need, you know, refills or something like that for other medications. Um, and I can get labs and, you know, get get the information that I need, then, then I do sometimes do some other things. Uh, you know, I'll order labs sometimes. And, you know, we do do other things. Um, I have a lot of patients, you know, who came to me for weight loss and stuff like that before who are still following with me. So I do prescribe sex and stuff like that online. Got it. And how about traveling unvaccinated and ivermectin prophylaxis? Um, so, you know, this this just reminds me that, you know, for a long time, I was really happy that no one in my practice who was taking prophylaxis had gotten long COVID or gotten acute COVID, you know. So, you know, thousands of people and I would keep telling patients, you know, out of 2,500, out of 2,700, you know, et cetera, you know, no one has caught COVID-19 until finally, you know, now we're, we're probably beyond, you know, 3,000 or 3,500 who are taking prophylaxis with ivermectin and one patient came back with a COVID-19 infection probably three or four weeks after starting prevention. And, and he traveled, you know, he went on a honeymoon. He wasn't careful, didn't wear masks, didn't wash his hands, you know, didn't distance or anything. You know, he was just like, you know, I'm safe. I'm on ivermectin. And, and he did catch COVID-19. So you, you have to be careful. I mean, people, you know, if you look back on your life, I mean, how often do you get sick when you travel? It's like, I mean, it's very hard not to get sick when you travel, you know, just traveling itself is stressful. And, you know, you go through security if you're traveling by plane, especially, um, you know, maybe driving is not that bad, but still there's just the stress associated with travel that will tax your immune system. But certainly if you're going through an airport and you're going through security, you know, there's been like a million people who've touched those bins, you know, it's like the dirtiest place in the world, probably, you know, the security line. Um, so just be very careful, wash your hands frequently, you know, wash your face, you know, as soon as you get through security, wash everything, <laughs> you know, exactly. just disinfect and, and disinfect, you know, the seat around you, just, just be careful when you're traveling. Um, you know, one thing I found really helpful for um, the very beginning of symptoms, you know, the, the first symptom at the very first sign, there's life extension has this zinc acetate lozenge. It's, it's a really fat lozenge and it, it, dissolves very slowly in your mouth. So it keeps the zinc levels really high in your mouth, right, where the vi you know, virus is entering. And I've found that to be extremely effective at nipping things in the bud. So if you, if you can buy one of those and just keep it with you, or, you know, a bottle of them, I find that very helpful. But, you know, other, you know, hand washing and just being careful is probably the most important thing. The other thing I, you know, that I just wanted to bring up um, that we don't really talk about a lot is that people, you know, who are overweight, you really have to lose weight. You know, th this is the biggest risk factor for people who are under 60 is probably just obesity, you know, being overweight and obese. You know, you really have to lose weight. So, you know, you, we spend, I think, too much time focusing on like incremental benefits of adding one more, you know, preventative, you know, zinc and this and that. And this other, you know, you know, find what, what, you know, all the different supplements and vitamins and things that I can be on. Um but we have to go back to basics also and tell people you just have to be healthy. You know, your, your best shot against this is to be slim, trim, and just live a healthy life, you know, and, and just be generally healthy. Got it. A couple of more questions. I know that we are coming to the hour as well, and you are in on the East Coast. It is near 10 o'clock. Uh, yeah. Gold Country says, would be no care, a bad case of yo-yo being. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is Dr. <laughs> Dr. Yo. Can we cure Dr. Yo? <laughs> okay. So the next question is from Leslie Ann Perez. For ivermectin, can someone start off with a low dose, for example, 3 milligram instead of 12 milligram, which is the recommended dose, and then work their way up to the recommended dose? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about prevention or maybe long haul, sure. I mean, if you're talking about acute COVID, then no, just, you know, go for the the dose that you're prescribed, you know, the, the recommended dose. But some people are, you know, very few, but there are people who are just extremely sensitive to any medication. And sure, they can try half a three milligram tablet if they want. Um, but eventually, I would say work up to the full dose and then and then take that as your starting day, you know, 
I, I don't know. I mean, that's my personal um, recommendation. I, I've had this question also, you know, Dr. Merrick recommends taking it all at once. Um, I don't know what the what the reasoning is. You know, it seems like it would build up if you take it twice a day. I mean, it doesn't seem, or if you spread it out during the day. Um, but he seems to be very um, certain that you have to take it all at once. So I'm not sure if that, what his reasoning is for that. If you know, you can tell me. No, I have not. So I have used in both ways, ways and it works. The, the half-life is long enough. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. So a um, so, few more questions. One is Sunita says, Dr. Heather, do you treat all ages or do you risk stratify? So I do treat all ages. Um, like I said earlier, I have treated probably a, one or two patients um, under 10 when the patient, when the parents really were really worried. Um, and certainly if a child is obese, for example, or, you know, severe asthmatic or something or diabetic type one, or, you know, some, some other risk factor, um, you know, I guess you could say you could, you know, certainly consider treating them. Um, I, I generally don't recommend prophylaxing, you know, along with, you know, in line with FLCCC recommendations, you know, I don't think there's a reason to prophylax children, but you can treat them certainly. And I do, I do treat children. Got it. So I'm going to go over the Twitter. There are fewer questions here. So we have already answered Dr. Yo's question. You're a spirit animal. So you are a dragon. Heather says, yeah, he was a great guest last time. So welcoming you. Morda, she, David says, question, if someone is already on fluvoxamine for other reasons, would it still help with COVID? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, this there there was you know a study. Steve Kirsch is linked to these studies where they, you know, did retrospective analyses of people who were on SSRIs, especially fluvoxamine and, and fluoxetine or Prozac, um, and and they did much better. You know, so it, it is beneficial. And um, some patient, a couple of patients, have actually chosen to switch to fluvoxamine or Prozac because of how beneficial it would be. You know, for for preventing severe infection. Got it. Thank you. Jane Woodring says, love Dr. Heather. I sent his previous interview with you uh, to many people who were interested in prophylaxis. Thanks for having him on again, his office and staff are first class. So that is a comment. And thank you very much for you and your team for helping at this hard time. Modashi David says, and I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing Mode Kai David, as a 60 something overweight, high blood pressure on meds, I have not yet vaccinated as I've been waiting for Pfizer, which is not available to me yet in Australia. Do you think it is too risky to wait and just rely on ivermectin if I get infected and develop symptoms? So, yeah, I mean, if you're 60 something and overweight, um, you know, I, I don't tell everyone that you have to take ivermectin as prophylaxis. You know, I'm kind of non-committal on it. Yeah, I just try to give people a way of thinking about it and everyone has to make the risk assessment for themselves and figure out, you know, because we really don't know a lot of th things for sure. Um, so, you, you, you know, I can tell you, uh, you know, kind of give you an idea of how to think about it. And you have to decide, do you want to make sure that you never catch COVID? In that case, you should take something, you know, get a vaccine or get ivermectin or both um, and take it as prophylaxis. If you're okay with catching the virus and having it enter your body, um, and you're sure that you're going to treat it on day one or two, you know, right away, then, you know, maybe it's safe for you to, to keep ivermectin on hand and fluvoxamine and, you know, some other medications, maybe a statin, maybe a, you know, a steroid inhaler and treat it right away. But some people get sick every month, you know, they, they're always coming down with the sniffles or they, they always have like allergies and they're not sure if it's a virus or if it's allergies or what it is. And they just can't pull the trigger on treatment, you know, every few weeks. So for them, it's, it, you know, treating is not going to really work because by the time they figure out it's COVID, it's going to be too late. You know, they're going to be on day five or six or later. Um, so deciding whether a vaccine makes sense or prophylaxis with ivermectin or treatment with ivermectin and other medications makes sense, it's really an individual decision. And it depends not just on your age and comorbidities, but also, you know, how risky of a lifestyle you have, how many, you know, the, the amount of COVID in your community, um, how careful you are, um, and whether you, you know, what your risk assessment is and risk tolerances for catching COVID and, and possibly developing long haul COVID. Um, you know, even people who don't know they have long COVID might have long COVID, 
right? So, so you could have organ damage. Um, that's a call organ damage. You know, everyone has an organ reserve, and their organ reserves, you know, decrease decrease over time. So, what if you have lung damage and you're just not aware of it after COVID? You know, so how would we know? You know, we don't really know what percentage of people truly have permanent damage to their organs after COVID that's just not detectable. It just doesn't drop below the level or the, the threshold where it develops a disease state, right? So, you know, these are, you know, and, and the same goes for kids. I don't know, you know, maybe these kids are going to develop some problem years later because they had COVID under 10. So there's a lot of unknowns right now. So, um, you know, from that point of view, you might say, I, I don't want to get this virus at all. You know, I want to do everything possible to prevent getting COVID. Um, Got it. Got it. On the other hand, you know, ivermectin weekly might also have subtle, you know, changes. It might subtly shift your physiology. You might develop some problem years later. You know, we think ivermectin is safe, but, you know, have we ever done this experiment on millions of people, giving them a drug, you know, for, you know, years or months? You know, we, we haven't done this with ivermectin before either. So th there's there's always there's a risk you know and um, reward you have to balance the risks and benefits of everything and it's a very difficult decision and it at the end it just boils down to what somebody kind of believes and gets drawn towards that's what I've seen it's not really a, always a scientific decision because we just don't have enough science to base this decision on. Got it. Uh, Andre D. Bale Hay says, ask how he's doing with post-vaccine tiredness, lung tightness numb lung, legs, et cetera. This is the new COVID. Um, with tiredness, I'm not sure. Um, so meaning, do you have, I think uh, what he's asking is that, do you get these patients? And if so, what is their management? Oh, right, right. Housing, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's the same thing. I mean, this is uh, the same drugs that work for, um, you know, long haulers work for post-vaccine syndromes. And, you know, it's, you know, ivermectin, steroids, fluvoxamine, Ravrock. And in my experience so far, you know, it's not a huge number of people that I've seen, maybe 10, maybe 15, possibly at this point. Um, they, they all seem to respond really well and very quickly. Um, it seems to be easier to treat than, than long haulers are right. in general. And I think that was also what I got from... Uh, was it the insult? Yeah, maybe um, somebody was also saying that don't worry about it. Just uh, get the vaccine because we can treat it, right? So, yeah, um, if Bruce you Patterson was saying, yeah, that. Dr. Patterson was saying that. Yeah. So Tiago Silva says, does ivermectin and fluvoxamine still work with Delta variants almost hundred percent? Given early, what doses? Yeah, so I think it it does work, and the. You know, I don't get pa patients coming to me telling me they have the Delta variant. So, I uh, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, we just have to assume that maybe the yeah. latest patients may be Delta. Yeah, that's that's the assumption. And you know, people around the world are using ivermectin and and fluvoxamine, and they're having success still. You know, there there aren't we're not getting reports of treatment failures. Um, you know, we are having people tell us that you need higher doses. Of ivermectin and some, you know, and and that's what we're doing now. You know, I am giving higher doses of ivermectin, so 0.4 milligrams per kilogram if they start, you know, day five or later, or if they just present with severe infection before day five, it would be 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. Um, where I would start the ivermectin, the fluvoxamine, I give the same dose. I don't change it. Um, it's going to be 50 twice a day for basically everyone, unless they just can't. Got it. So one last question. It. Sorry. So one last question, Moorhouse Joplin says, Dr. Heather, in your practice, what are the main comorbidities for COVID in non-diabetics and non-obese under 60 years? Uh, so not obese, not diabetics, probably hypertension, um, get a lot of hypertensives and you know people with dyslipidemia do come in. So there are a lot of people on statins. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the diabetes and obesity, those are the big ones. So if you take those out, it's, it's going to be hypertension and dyslipidemia. Got it. One last question. Asthmatics from... also. You know, asthmatics are actually pretty common. Yes. Diabetes as well, maybe. So this was non-diabetes. So yeah. one last question. I promise this was the last one. So M MSNBC says, I have primary hyperparathyroid disease that is being monitored. What would this do to me if I got, got COVID? If I take too much D3, I get symptoms. I don't have bone or kidney stone problems. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, we don't know how COVID affects, you know, every different, you know, specific disease, right? Um, and the same with the vaccines, you know, people come to me and they're like, you know, I have this and that. It hasn't been studied with the vaccines. Of course not. I mean, we just don't have the ability to study everything and see how it's going to respond. Um, obviously, you know, p some people can't take high dose vitamin D and, you know, you, you have to use other things. It's not the only thing that we have in our toolbox. So, you know, rely on other, other things instead of vitamin D. Um, you know, people have to know that there's, there's like probably hundreds of drugs that you can use against COVID-19. So there's plenty of other things out there. You know, you, you don't have to worry that you can't use one of them, you know, use the others. Got it. So with this, thank you very much. I know it is 10 o'clock or beyond 10 o'clock at your place. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. You know, I always learn a lot being with you. And thank you from all the cool beans as well. Cool beans, I would see you on Monday. Bye for now.